Hello, everyone. This is Chris Hutting, Project Manager at the Free Market Foundation. Uh, thanks for being with us with this latest episode of the Free Marketeers. It might be our last one for the year. I'll see if I can wrangle a few more guys around the office to uh, discuss uh, what's been quite an interesting year, if I can say the least. But for now, um, we've got a very special episode today, someone I've been following now for quite a while, been lucky enough to read a lot of her work, her articles, um, that kind of thing, and just follow her on social media. So today we have Hannah Cox with us. Hannah, thanks very much for being here. Thanks for having me on, Chris. So viewers and listeners, for you, those of you who don't know, Hannah is the Senior National Manager at Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty and Fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education, as well as a contributor to the Washington Examiner. Now, Hannah, before I keep on reading down that list ad infinitum, what can you tell us a bit about yourself, your background? I mean, your, your sort of interest in libertarianism, conservatism, did you come sort of into the world, you know, a pro free speech advocate, <laughs> uh, a pro the Second Amendment kind of thing, or was it a bit of a journey for you? Um, it was sort of both. I think I grew up in a very conservative household, not libertarian by any means. Um, and my parents are more of like the Bush, Marco Rubio kind of variety Republicans. And so like a lot of kids, I think for the most part, I just sort of fell in line with where my family was. I listened to Rush Limbaugh and I watched Fox News. And in 2008, I was in college and I didn't go to school to be in politics. That wasn't really what I thought my career would look like or what I intended to do. I thought it was interesting, but it just wasn't. Um, my goal. And I remember uh, Obama and McCain were coming to speak at my college. They were actually were holding one of the debates at my university where I went. And I was very much in the John McCain camp. I thought he was fantastic. <laughs> I thought Obama might be the Antichrist. Like I just had all these very like basic views that you would find in, in the Republican Party. And, um, and I kind of stayed there for a long time because again, this wasn't something I was studying. I wasn't really progressing. Um, in 2012, I voted for Romney and I remember I was so mad at the Ron Paul people that they wouldn't just fall in line and get behind the nominee because we needed to defeat Obama. You know, I was like, they're both Republicans. Like, what's wrong with you guys? Who cares? <laughs> and, and, you know, not seeing the very big chasm of difference between the policies of Mitt Romney and, and Ron Paul. So um, it really wasn't until 2013 that I started to get involved with politics and progress in my views. Um, so I was very pro Second Amendment all along, very pro fr free speech. But I didn't really have a consistent ideology and didn't really know why I believed what I believed. And um, in 2013, I was looking to get out of the music industry, which is what I had gone to school for. I was working in entertainment and I hated it. I was absolutely miserable. I hated every single day of it. And I thought I was going to go back to law school. But before I did that, before I took on more student debt, I wanted to make sure I'd really like it because I'd already gone down this one pathway of pursuing music and spending a lot of money to be in that industry and hating it. So I was looking for something I could do on the side of my full time job in music, something where I could work around the law, be around an attorney, see if I actually liked the day to day of it. And then if I did, I was going to go to law school. And so I found the Second Amendment group in Tennessee that was sort of like a bit right of the NRA. And I thought, well, I love the Second Amendment. There was an attorney that ran the organization. So I was <clears throat> going to get to work alongside him. And it just seemed like a perfect, uh, perfect fit for what I was looking to do. So I started uh, working with them as their director of development for a few months. And it was just this crash course on American politics for me. I was going around, I was speaking across Tennessee. I was meeting with Tea Party groups. I was talking to a lot of Republicans. I was starting to see what the legislature actually did, you know, seeing what Republicans do when they're off the campaign trail. And I was like, none of you people actually support limited government. <laughs> like, there's nothing fiscally conservative about any of this. And, and I think that I did at least have those solid principles, right? I really was brought up to believe in limited government and, and individual liberty and fiscal responsibility. And when I saw what was happening, I was like, none of this is, is checking. Um, and I also was encountering a lot of beliefs among the grassroots that ultimately grew into Trumpism and into nationalism, which were really contradictory to those to those baseline values that I had. Um, and so what it did was it actually forced me to go and figure out what did I actually believe? What were the underlying um, principles of that? So I read The Law by Frederic Bastiat, and that was a really 
big moment for me. It opened up the world of Austrian economics. I started reading a lot more in that vein. Um, I started following Justin Amash and Rand Paul and some of these more like libertarian leaders who I started realizing like, oh, these are the people that are actually preaching the values I was brought up to espouse. Um, and so I, I developed in that way. And I, I realized pr pretty quickly that I was more of the libertarian variety of the Republican Party. And so that was how it kind of came about. That was how I decided I want, wanted to work in politics. I realized that I really liked the nature of the work I was doing with the Second Amendment group, but I couldn't just work for anybody. They were too far right for me. And so I took about two years and just built up my resume, got to know people, tried my hand at things. I worked on some campaigns. I started writing. I started um, a coalition for millennials to give them a platform to write. I did some pro bono lobbying for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, and I just took two years while I was still working in the music industry to basically build up my political um, avenues and then eventually went full time in 2016 in the industry with a free market think tank in Tennessee. I think it's always interesting, uh, maybe for those on the left, more traditionally, they assume that everyone, I'm, I'm going to say broadly on the right, agrees exactly on everything. So it's interesting to hear you say your experience was you know, maybe there are some things where there's con there's not conflict but just some shades of, of of variety i guess amongst people even if they're on the same sort of in the same kind of broad tent kind of thing definitely definitely and i think that that still remains true today you know in america we have two parties <laughs> and and oh. by no means can two parties fully encapsulate all of the views of 360 million individuals it's actually mm -hmm. quite ridiculous and, and we desperately need more parties more representation we're supposed to have this government where we we don't have a democracy we have a representative government we have a republic and the people aren't actually being represented in our country because mm -hmm. these two parties have blocked so many other veins and avenues of thought um, and so we've got these really uncomfortable marriages and you see it on the left and in the right where I think a lot of people feel pretty politically homeless these days. They don't really fit neatly into either two party. Um, there's many people who are continuing to try to work within those parties to push the things they want. But there's, you know, when you look at a party that can have libertarians and neocons in the same party yeah. there, I mean, I'm as different from a neocon in my ideology as I am from a communist. There, there, <laughs> there is nothing that we have in common as far as how we value life, as far as how we view the government's role, like as far as what we think is ethical. I mean, it is, it is such a wide chasm of difference in ideology and yet we're under the same tent and you see it on the left too with um progressives with people who are you know more of the bernie sanders type having to get along with with joe biden's there there's not a lot of um commonality there and so and so that's a problem with our system as a whole i found it interesting in a way but also yeah a, a bit depressing i guess to hear that Joe Biden isn't that keen on uh, meeting with a certain organization that he uh, he was very pro beforehand, but now uh, it doesn't seem like he's really going to engage with those issues. I guess if he engages with the ground, the grassroots issues, it's better than engaging with the organization. We all, you know, we have certain views on on the organization. But regardless, I wanted to touch a bit on what you said there about. Um, the importance of of life valuing you know human life individual lives um of, as i mentioned in the introduction one of your positions is that conservatives concerned about the death penalty so you know your view on the death penalty broadly i mean is it sort of fine within certain defined contexts is it pretty much against it regardless where where do you come down on that particular thorny issue? I mean, maybe in some ways it shouldn't be a thorny issue. One should have clear moral views about it. But what do you think? Um, I don't know. You know, I used to be very supportive of the death penalty. So I've got a lot of, of okay. grace and empathy for people in that camp. I, I get where they're coming from. Um, but the death penalty is a calamity. It's a national embarrassment. It's something that our grandkids are going to ask, what did you do to stop this when this was occurring in this country? You know, like right now growing up when I was, you know, my parents were born in the 60s. So I was like, where were you during the civil rights movement? What were you doing? And my mom was like, I was five. <laughs> I wasn't doing much. Give me a break. <laughs> But I think that's going to happen, right? If you look at our justice system as a whole, if you look at what we're doing in this country, at how we're treating people at, at the gross um, injustice and miscarriages of justice that are happening in this system, it's really egregious. And I think we're going to have a lot to answer for to future generations about the human rights violations that are occurring right now. Um, the death penalty is certainly no exemption from that. And I think that's that's the main problem if I had to point one out to people who do support the death penalty. And, and again, I used to be in that camp. But, you know, we believe in a limited government 
because we know it's prone to error and to corruption and to inequality. And that even when it has the best of intentions, it messes things up. It gets it wrong. And for some reason, so many people on the right have just excluded the justice system from that understanding of government for so long. They don't see it as an operation of government, which it is. And, it, and it's marked by all of the same problems. And there's no reason that we should ever want to give this system the power over life and death. And so I, I often tell people, you know, I I did not become opposed to the death penalty because I saw it as a human rights violation. I now do think that, but I became opposed to it because of how it operated in practice and because there were just so many flaws within the system. And so I don't need people to agree with me uh, holistically about its appropriateness. I do need them to look at how it operates in practice and recognize that there is no defense in the system, no point in trying to continue it because it's it's absolutely failed. It does not deter crime. It wastes millions and millions of dollars that could deter crime. We know things that we could be doing to prevent crime in the first place. We're not doing them. We're not funding them. Uh, we also need to solve more crimes. You know, the actual deterrent to crime is the assurance that one will be caught and punished for their crimes. In the United States, our average homicide clearance rate, which just means that someone is charged for the crime, not necessarily convicted, is about 60% on average. So if you kill somebody in this country, your likelihood of getting away with it is pretty good. We need to be spending those dollars to actually go and get justice for all victims. Um, and when you start looking into which victims do we pursue death sentences for, which victims do we spend the excess millions of dollars that it costs to pursue a death sentence? Um, there's a lot of disparity there. There's a lot of bias or along racial and socioeconomic lines. Um, we see that there are many murder victims, family members who oppose it for these reasons. Um, some oppose it because they feel it brings them more harm and because they feel like it's unethical. Others oppose it because they lost a loved one who got no closure, no justice, no attention because of the money we were spending on the death penalty. So as a whole, it's a broken system. It doesn't work. It kills innocent people. We've had one person exonerated for every nine executions. So at that rate, we know we kill innocent people every year. Um, it's, right. it's also biased based on who gets it, um, the defendants. And so there's, there's all these problems that um, should be enough for anyone who believes in a limited government and fiscal responsibility and pro-life values to walk away from this. Uh, one thing I especially wanted to highlight about what you said was just the role of the state. And I think we can extrapolate this around the world. And especially in South Africa, we've had 10 years of endemic state corruption. The bigger the state, the higher the chances for corruption and abuse. If you sort of have this big pot just sitting there, you're going to have different uh, interest groups competing to control that. So we shouldn't be surprised when, <laughs> sorry, when that brings about the worst in society, those people who want to control those levers of power kind of thing. So it's, I think there's the practical element that, like what you say, look at these policies as they're implemented, but also what kind of society do you want to live in, you know, regardless of which party is in charge. That shouldn't, it, it shouldn't matter who the president is. They, they should have such little power. It's quite, I guess, sad to see how it's become, I guess, a game of sports in a way, your sports teams, where it's a case of life or death, which party is going to win. It shouldn't matter that much. That's exactly right. And I think that that's something that we, I hope, I hope that's the takeaway that people are having from the past four years here with Trump, which right. not a Trump supporter. I never, I never thought he was somebody who pushed um, my values of limited government, mm -hmm. individual liberty and fiscal conservatism. Um, but I, I do think for people on the left who've been outraged enough in arms over him, it's sort of an I told you so moment of you probably shouldn't have let the presidency get this big or have this much power because look at what can happen. And, and now yeah. we see people on the right doing the same thing. You know, there's this big argument here going on around Section 230, which pertains to the Internet and free speech on the Internet. And there's this proposal that uh, a senator has. Uh, I, I just I've never seen this certain senator come up with a good idea in his existence. But um, Senator Joss Hawley introduced this bill where he wants to essentially say, if you make a certain amount of money, if you're a big enough company, you're you don't get the protections of Section 230. And the only way you can get them back is to let the government, the FTC, come in and basically regulate your protocols, decide if your algorithms are appropriate, and then you can get the protections back. And it's this really kind of like it's a terrible idea. It makes people mad, but also it's kind of funny where it's like, do you not think this couldn't, the system couldn't fall into the hands of people you hate and then be even more problematic? I mean, just no foresight whatsoever. And it's very frustrating. But on that line, you know, playing devil's advocate, what about that argument, how these platforms are public utilities kind of thing. So therefore, you know, they should be neutral kind of thing, quote unquote. We all know how well, or, or well, how well, we all know the net neutrality advocates, they feared that 
Twitter and Google would charge us to visit their pages if it wasn't implemented, it wasn't yeah. implemented, and we can still use these platforms. So what do you think about that sort of line of argument, the public utility view? Yeah, they don't have a very good track record on being right on these matters. Um, right. But the thing is, they're not public utilities. These are private mm -hmm. companies. These are companies that spend their own money, that continue to spend their own money to be in existence. There are plenty of them to pick from. If you don't like the way they operate, you don't have to use them. And and furthermore, it is not essential to use them, right? Like we right. have plenty of means of communication without having to rely on Twitter or Facebook. And so the idea that we can treat this like the phone company is, is really antiquated and just a, a big stretch, I think. Um, second, if they want them to be public utilities, then they need to actually lobby the American people for us to, pa to pay the taxpayer dollars to create public utilities that match them. And, and they don't want to do that because the public support isn't there, because largely people are happy with these models. They use them for free. <laughs> Nobody's forcing you onto Twitter or Facebook. You have millions and millions of people who willingly use mm -hmm. it, who get um, satisfaction out of it, who get interaction out of it, who enjoy using them. I'm one of them. I love being on Twitter. And, and I do that fully well knowing they're taking my data. <laughs> that, that they're probably biased against my views. But, you know, the same as if I operated a, a, a hard um, and present business, if you came into my restaurant and you were screaming obscenities or you were saying there's a bomb when there wasn't, I have every right to make you leave. And yeah. so do these companies. So I, I just think there's a real hypocrisy in the way that this is being viewed by some. And, and this is my big problem as a free market advocate, as a limited government advocate. I'm always having to say to people on the left, you know, I can't promise you a perfect future. That's not no, what no. these ideas offer. That's not the, that's not what freedom is. Freedom has very big downsides. It has mm -hmm. consequences. It has negatives. It has responsibilities. And it's, it's knowing that things won't always work out your way, but the chance to make them work out your way, to be the master of your own destiny is a better risk than having somebody else try to centrally plan your life and the negatives that come with that. People on the right in this country have got to relearn that lesson. You don't right. get everything you want. You don't get to have everything handed to you. You're not entitled to things. You're entitled to go and build a competitor to Twitter if you don't like how it mm -hmm. operates. You're entitled to not use Twitter. You're entitled to try to convince other people to not use Twitter. You're not allowed to go use the big government to come in and squash people and hurt them when you, they don't act the way you like. That's not freedom. Um, that's that's a really dangerous mentality, and I see the right moving in that in that direction on more than one on more than one issue. And I think that's highly problematic and needs to be stomped out. I'm sure we can see something like Twitter being run very well as a public utility, like something like Amtrak. I'm sure that'll go down God. very well. <laughs> Total I've only had right. one experience with Amtrak, so and I probably <laughs> won't repeat that anytime soon. I was stuck in DC for like three hours because it was oh, behind God. schedule and stuff like that. So I've had my fair fair You're shake done. with that kind of thing. <laughs> um, touching a bit on idealism, I guess, and utopianism, you know, in your tagline, you mention you say that you know you're a rabid capitalist. So, to you, what what makes capitalism the ideal system or the moral system? Do you do you see it as one of those things where you need this you know mixed system with some controls on you know something something else thrown in? Where do you sort of come down on on capitalism? Yeah, I am a rabid free market defender, and I do think it is the vastly superior and more moral system of the alternatives we have. My big problem in this country lately is that we, our education system is failing so unilaterally that the vast majority of people have no idea what capitalism is. And so when right, you see sure. it being attacked, when you see them mad at a certain problem, if you really start, you know, having a conversation with people and, and digging into it a bit more, you're like, oh, what you're actually mad about is a government intervention in the market and a policy or a regulation. Like, that's not capitalism. But they think the government is capitalism because we have a capitalistic system. So it's it's this right. really kind of ironic thing where they're mad at, at capitalism and they want to see another system come about when in reality they're mad at government intervention and the system they want to see it come about would be more of that. So um, yeah, yeah. it's just this really big education gap that we need to address. And I think that um, on the right and in libertarian circles, we've done a bad job at that, right? We've, we've been really good at shouting down socialism, which we should, but we've not been as good at shouting down 
cronyism, which is every bit as big of a problem sure. and which is an enemy of free markets and capitalism. And so that's the line we need to be um, taking these days. And um, and I think there's a really big opportunity to actually have conversations and message people and, and come together and, and understand the real um, the real opponent that we face, the real actual evil in our society. And it traces back to government and government power. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as my, my feelings about capitalism in general, you know, capitalism is the only system in the world that basically says in order to get ahead, you have to make yourself useful to other people. You have to find a way to contribute to society and provide value that people will pay you for in order for you to get money and pay other people. That's a good thing. That's a good incentive. In every other system, we don't see that, right? We see that incentive removed. Um, we see people become dependent. We see a lot of abuses of power. Capitalism continues to get other factors out of the way. And again, it's not perfect. You're not going to have a perfect system in capitalism. There will be losers. That is a harsh reality of life. We don't live in a utopia. We don't live in a heaven. We live on earth where there are winners and losers. And the big um, important thing is that you have the chance to change your circumstances. You have the autonomy. Um, as somebody who really kind of got into politics uh, while working around mental health, like I said, I, I volunteered for NAMI for some time, I can tell you that personal autonomy is such a difference maker in our mental and holistic well-being. When you have the ability to determine your fate, to control your own circumstances, um, that actually is empowering. That's something that is important to people. It's an essential need that we have. Capitalism gives you that. You can work really hard and get ahead. Doesn't mean you will. It doesn't mean you're not going to have to redirect or try other pathways. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have setbacks, but you have the chance to work and do that. And in other systems, we don't see um, that transpire. So I do think there is a, a moral aspect to it. But on top of that, I'm a real dollars and cents person. I am very much a person of does this work? And, and like I said, right. I changed my mind on things like the death penalty when I dug in and said, this doesn't wash, the data doesn't work, it's not working, and I'm very able to let things like that go. If that were the case with capitalism, if the data worked against it, if I were able to see evidence of it not working or another system working better, I'd leave it in the dust. But yeah. unequivocally, that has never been the case. In every single country where capitalism has been tried, where free markets have been expanded, we have seen a mass growth of wealth. We have seen an elevation in the quality and standards of human life. And again, it's not perfect, but the progression that we see is yeah. vast. And especially yeah. as we see it progressing to third world countries over the past two, three decades, if you look at what's happening in some of these countries, it is phenomenal. It's so mm -hmm. exciting to see it happen. And on the reverse, every single time we have seen socialism attempted, it has led to destitution. It has led to devaluation. It has led to death. Um, it is it is a system yeah. that has failed every single time it has been tried. And so we need to keep trying for the system that has produced good results when we've tried it and keep trying to perfect it and keep trying to push back the things that are infringing upon it, like cronyism. I think you raise a really important point about the utopianism and we shouldn't fall prey to that as free market advocates. That's not a standard by which I, I think we should measure ourselves. We should measure ourselves by the standard of what works in the world in which we're in. What can we do with what we have and what is the best system to sort of attain that that world in which people are on average better off than they would otherwise be. I, I can't remember the original um, sort of attribution of the quote, but who, the person who said, "The natural state is poverty." What what ingredients do you need to attain prosperity for the majority of people? Well, you know, look at the systems around the world that have been tried and the extent to which, and then apply those accordingly. I wanted to ask you, and you know, this might be too big a question, so you can decide how to sort of frame it or tackle it. But putting you on the spot a bit about, I guess, projecting into the future. For the US, do you perceive things going steadily, progressively, you know, in the capital P sense of the word, uh, ever downward? Or do you think there's the chance that things could improve drastically? Do you see something like secession happening? I mean, maybe if California seceded, some people think that's the, the solution to American problems. I think it's a bit deeper than that. So what do you think about the US's tra trajectory, as it were? Well, I kind of laugh at the succession suggestion um, mm -hmm. because I work at state capitals and <laughs> the number of people who will get off their butts and walk over to their state capital and go meet with their lawmaker on an issue is like 
maybe, maybe 1% of the population. So this idea that all these like bubbas are going to pick up guns and take to the streets and like fight their government. Ha ha ha. Do something else first. Like, let's see it. I mean, come on. Like I, as a whole, like, I just think it's kind of laughable having worked around politics. Like the, the average American is so disengaged, is so out of touch with what happens in our system. And, and largely, I think just doesn't really care. <laughs> I don't think most people go about their days looking at politics, focusing on it. I think, you know, you and I are in the minority. And, and I think that to some extent, that's okay, right? Like, I, I do yeah. think there's a delinquency in our population, I think, in order to have a, a representative government that actually works, we have to be um, educated, we have to be on top of it. And, and our society has been failing in that regard for many, many decades. Um, but on the other hand, I think arguably people who are in the other camp are happier. They're going about their day. They're seeing their family. They're not, you know, focusing on all of these things that are occurring in this apparatus that doesn't really touch them. Um, and so I think you can look at it. I don't you know, see the matrix cycle. like we do. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. They're blissfully unaware. And and so I don't know. I think you could say that's good and bad. Um, and as far as where we go as a country, I think the same. You know, there's there's a glass half full perspective and there's a glass half empty perspective. I think um I don't see there's some there's some real barriers to change in our country. And and I think that a lot of times the people who do get active, like with the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, um, and I'm supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement, absolutely. But the organization itself, the things it's working for are not going to fix the problems. Um, and I see people get distracted in that way a lot of the time. Like I hear so many people be like, yeah, we just need term limits. And I'm like, that's meh. <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to do it. You know, or let's say we need to get rid of lobbyists. I'm like, no, we, we need lobbyists. Trust me. Most of these lawmakers can't tell you anything about the criminal justice system, much less tech or farming or like all the other things they have to weigh in on. So it's, it's a good thing to have lobbyists. The real things we have to change in this country are, are difficult because we have two parties that have, have entrenched themselves in power and they have absolutely no incentive to change these things. Um, and so until an outside force gets involved, to make them, we're going to be in the same in the same camp. And largely what has to happen is we have to change the money in politics. I mean, plain and simple, we don't really start to actually get our government back until we do. Because right now, if I donate to my representative who's supposed to represent me and I give him, let's say, five hundred dollars a month, which would be a lot for me. That doesn't that's nothing to him if he's getting a hundred thousand dollars from a big company. He's going to be beholden to that company or to that large donor. And that that person, that donor doesn't even have to live in my district. But they then have more control over the decisions that my representative makes because he's going to have to come back to them for money the next time around. They're constantly having to raise money. We need to reduce the amount of money that can be spent on elections. We need to uh, make it to where people cannot take money from outside of their districts so that they actually are beholden to people in their actual districts that that's who they're representing. We need to fix those those dollar interests right now. It's a sham. There's a great documentary um, for people who aren't up to speed on this on HBO called um, the swamp that features several of our congressmen talking about this, how they basically spend all of their days fundraising. They pay their party to get committee seats. They have to pay all of these kind of um, fees to have any kind of power or say within Congress whatsoever. And even then they don't have real power. They do what the party tells them to do or they'll be kicked out. Um, and so, and so until we fix that structure, the big things will not change in this country. We will continue to progress on the pathway that we're on. And, and I love F.A. Hayek's um, Why I'm Not a Conservative short essay that, con that compares these party systems in America to a train. And progressivism is this is the steam engine that is going full steam ahead right off a cliff. The track's going off the cliff and it's, it's going as fast as it can in that direction. And conservatism is merely the brakes. And those are your two major parties in the US. They don't, the conservatism doesn't have an alternate pathway. They're not trying to move in another direction. And because of that, the engine will end up going off the tracks if nothing else occurs. I think classical liberalism, libertarianism in America is another alternate track that we need to steer over to. Um, but we don't have the power. We don't have the political power. And there's a reason for that. It's not because it's not popular, but it's because the two parties have come in and made it virtually impossible for third parties to succeed. There are strenuous barriers, cost barriers, 
um, signature barriers, all kinds of things you have to jump through. Um, like you can't be in the debate unless you get 15% in the polls, but the news outlets won't include you in the polls because most of them are Democrats and they want to keep their nominee up. Um, the other two parties have no reason to push for that to change because they don't want more competition on that stage. They want it to be the two of them. If you look at the state level, to get on the ballot as a libertarian or as a green party, you have to have, in Tennessee, for one example, a third of the number of people who voted in the past governor's election. That's something like 35,000 signatures. To get on the ballot as a Republican or Democrat, you need 25. So it's these very serious, and then and then if you do it, which the Libertarian Party in Tennessee did do that, they raised that number of signatures a few years ago, and a number of the signatures were just arbitrarily thrown out by the State Department and they had to give no explanation for that whatsoever. So it's this constant battle that um, I, I think that things like ranked choice voting could be a good solution to get around what they've done with the parties. But these big systemic things, um, ending taxpayer funded lobbying, you know, right now when I'm at the state capitol, like I said, a lot of Americans aren't showing up, even when public support is on my side of the issue. Who shows up? The prosecutors associations, the police unions, um, bureaucrats who work for the government, and they show up and they work on my time, on my tax dollars time. I'm paying them to be there to lobby against my interests and work against the will of the American people. We need to end taxpayer funded lobbying. So there's there's these really big systemic things that people should have in their focal points and, and largely don't. So I think until we address those things, we will keep moving in a direction that I think is bad for the country. I didn't know that you sort of worked in state capitals. So that that immediately made me think, oh, she her everyday life is like parks. <laughs> no, and I don't work in the capitals. Know. I lobby at them. Yeah. So I get to oh, leave. Okay, okay. Okay. So it's not so it's not that whimsical, um, like we like we're led to believe no. in Fox and Rick. <laughs> <laughs> um just the this is sort of a, an out an outflow of the question about the future of the US, but the differences in different states. So to touch on an American South African, Elon Musk, who's done very well for himself. And I have my own, I guess, complicated views about him. I really admire his innovation and how he's pushing things. But at the same time, he got lots of subsidies and, and that kind of thing. Um, so it's a bit of an interesting character. But you see even someone like him criticizing the Californian um, state government a lot during the lockdown. Even now, recently, he's, I believe he's moving to Austin. I might be wrong, um, but he's moving to Texas. Um, a few other uh, companies and, and big people in California have said they'll be leaving the state. So do you foresee that sort of thing as a good thing? I guess people leaving places like California and New York. Well, I guess good for who, because I think um, right. what's going to transpire is you're going to have a lot of Californians in Texas and Texas is going to turn blue, at which point I don't see a national pathway forward for the Republican Party. Um, I've been okay. saying since 2016 you know, I disagreed with Trump. I disliked Trump as a whole. Um, but more importantly than my feelings on him as a person, I thought that what he would do um, looking ahead as somebody who does have some foresight is really hurt the GOP's chances in the future. And we need a strong second party. We already have kind of a, a underdog second party in the Republican um, in the Republican entity, whereas the Democrats have the popular vote by and large across the right. country, um, pretty on lock. And mm. the GOP needs to do things that will actually set it up to attract more people, new people, build stronger coalitions. Um, I think what they've done is position themselves to lose elections for the next year. Mm. They've largely pushed libertarians out with Trump and with the nationalists. They've let in a lot of very problematic people, racist, mm. conspiracy theories, um, people they've let in misogynist. And, and I don't know that that's always Trump's um, fault, but I certainly don't yeah. think he's, he's sounded the alarm that those people aren't welcome here. And, mm. and we've, we've seen those characters really come in and, and take over. And you've seen a lot of people with um, traditional limited government values, fiscal conservative values, who continue to stand by those beliefs really back away. Like, I'm not mm. going to be associated with this. Whatever's going on over here, Mm -mm, get me far away from it. And that's been me too. Like I probably, although I realized in 2013, 2014, I was a little bit more of the Rand Paul libertarian variety of the Republican party. I probably would have kept voting Republican at large up until Trump. And now sure. I'm like, I don't know what would have to happen for me to come back over there and vote Republican at the national level. Now at the state level, there's great Republicans doing tremendous work. Sure. And, and I admire many of them and work very closely with them. But at the national level, um, it's quite an embarrassment and it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as, as we see these um, migration patterns occurring, especially um, accelerated with COVID from some of these states, 
you're going to see some places turning blue quite quickly that um, I think would have turned blue ultimately anyways. I think Texas was heading in that direction, but I think it would have been five to 10 years. And now I'm like, it's, I think it's a couple years away. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I think the GOP is going to have to really have a reckoning and restructure and, and they're nowhere close to being ready to do that. They're still very deep into la la conspiracy land with this election stuff, thinking it's rigged and, um, you know, that's the problem the Democrats had in 2016, I think, when they were on that same la-la train mm -hmm. thinking it was Russia hacking their election instead of being like, oh, people hate us. <laughs> Why do people hate us? What do we need to change? What policies should we move on? How can we attract people back? They never did that. Um, they never, you know, it's, it, it was one of those situations of like, it's definitely you. It's not us. But they were like, no, 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 no. It's not us. Like we no, can't be like there's definitely a conspiracy here. And the Republicans are doing the same thing, which is just unfortunate for all of us because both of these parties really suck and need to have a reckoning and come to Jesus and and restructure and reevaluate. But I don't um, I don't see them doing that. And so I think we could be in for a, a long haul as people who want to see limited government values come about. We're not probably likely to have a strong champion for some time. I think when one becomes obsessed with just action and power and doing things, you tend to uh, lose sight of your principles. So in the quest to to get things done, quote unquote, um, I think a lot of principled people in the circles that you mentioned have uh, left, and I don't know if they'll ever find a good home again. Um, Hannah, I also wanted to ask you about just some of the hypocrisy on the left. And, you know, in my mind, I have sort of the figure of, and this might be unfair to her, so I acknowledge that, but the figure of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, but someone who will advocate for these policies, but then we see, uh, you know, they'll probably never, they'll never be subject to the effects of their policies. We're just seeing it now in 2020 with lockdown. I mean, in South Africa, I don't know of any politician or bureaucrat who's given up any part of their salary to people who have lost their jobs or their small businesses for all the talk of we are, we're in this together and we all need to <laughs> sacrifice and pull together kind of thing. So do you think that sort of thing can be used against the hard left, just showing some of their hypocrisy, how they advocate for these ideas, but they won't live in places where those ideas are actually implemented. What do you think it says about that sort of worldview? Yeah. And I think it, that, you know, when we talk about the lockdowns, that's a hypocrisy on both sides. We've not had right. nearly enough um, politicians standing up against these lockdowns, which are not right. based on science, which have never proven to be effective at slowing the spread of COVID and which are amplifying the traumatic results of a pandemic. They are ruining people's lives. They're causing severe mental uh, illness problems. They are uh, creating a world where children are falling behind in their educational attainment creating worse inequality. And so especially for people on the left who, you know, constantly preach inequality and constantly yeah. preach about poverty to stand for this kind of system is severely hypocritical. Um, but I don't know that their base sees it that way. I think there's a lot of fear mongering sure. that occurs. I think the media has been in lockstep on that. They're not elevating things like I just said, you know, there are studies out there showing the lockdowns don't work. You don't see that in the New York Times. You don't see that um, being broadcast as a whole. And so I think um, people are, are pretty gullible and I think they're pretty um, susceptible to being misled by their leaders, by their politicians. And so I think there are many people who think it's for the common good, that they're doing the right thing, that they're protecting public health, that this is, you know, noble and honorable and that the other side's just selfish. And I think that's that's their narrative and they're sticking with it. So I don't know that we'll see their base wake up. Um, certainly there have been plenty of their examples in history of their hypocrisy that should have woke their base up and have not. So um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little um, pessimistic on that. But I do think um, outside of the two bases of the parties, which you have to remember in America, you know, it feels like everybody's in these two camps. They're not. Oh. Most people are over here in the middle like these guys are crazy. <laughs> um, and so you've got the really like diehard partisans that are bought in on either side. But I think for the average American who's in the middle, who's not super partisan, I do think that what we're doing right now is a wake up call that the government's not your friend. They're not looking out for your interests that in this country, while we love to go around and be like raw, raw freedom, you have lost a lot of your freedoms over the past hundred years and you didn't even notice it because it wasn't impacting your day to day yet. And yeah, now it yeah. is about to, um, you're recognizing, you know, I work around policing. I've, we've been calling for reform and policing for accountability for, um, for, you know, help for decades. There is a problem in this institution 
And we've had a lot of opposition from people that say, well, you're anti-cop. And now they're recognizing that cops are actors of the government and they're the ones that are going to come shut down your church service. And they're the ones that are going to come find you when you open your business. And maybe they're not on your side. You know, and I think for a lot of white Americans, that's the first time they've they've been on the wrong end of the agreement in this situation. So I do hope it is waking some people up to things that we've been pointing to for many, many, many years in this country. Um, and I, I do hope the takeaway is that fewer people trust their government, that fewer people um, and that fewer people see it as a partisan issue because it's not. Both sides are really bad. Both sides are complicit. Both sides are working against you and your interests. Um, and I think that, you know, in this past election, I had so many people that were like, wouldn't you prefer Trump to Biden though? And I'm like, literally, no, it is a wash in my bucket. Like I don't, they're both so bad that I, my conscience could never go vote for them or support them. Like terrible people, terrible policies. I don't see how you think one side's better than the other, but there's this team mentality that we've had in this country that like, maybe my side's bad on this, but we're better than them in these ways, but we're losing that. And I think people are waking up to that. Um, that both sides are problematic. And and that to me is a silver lining of COVID, I think, because that's always been true. It's just on display a bit more right now. We often talk about the the idea of the Overton window and shifting sort of public opinion. But I think the statists of whatever stripe have done very well at shifting their own Overton window, whether it's a statist in the form of a Democrat or a Republican, progressively. And, you know, it doesn't have an, happen overnight um, unless it's something like, like lockdowns. But government controls have progressively just increased and increased. Nowadays, when you say anything, especially in South Africa, regarding state-owned companies, for example, the, the basic answer is, well, you're pro-privatization, so you want people to lose jobs. It's sort of immediate reaction like that. There's no nuance to, to the, these, these sorts of discussions. And I think that's purely a result of, of the ever-increasing uh, power of the state. Um, before we, I think, finally wrap up, I also wanted to give you a bit of a chance to just talk about people, you know, it could be contemporary thinkers, uh, thinkers from years ago. You've mentioned a few writers and, and philosophers, economists, that kind of thing, but um, figures who you think people should go and look at, go read. You know, I know we all don't make nearly enough time to go read everything we should, but what to you do you think if people went into and looked at, even for those who might find themselves a bit more on the left, what sort of thing would should they look at or, or read, you know? Well, I'm a really big advocate of reading things you disagree with, because I think if we want to break out of this team mentality, it's so essential to get away from the straw man, like you mentioned. And, and I've often written about this and posted um, about this, but when you don't know people, who mm -hmm. think differently than you, you're very susceptible to fear mongering, you're susceptible to stereotypes, um, you're susceptible to straw man arguments about their beliefs, making them into caricatures, making the opposition evil or immoral or selfish. And, and as a whole, you're going to be pretty uneducated and quite a bore, I think. So I think the best thing you can do is, is go actually meet some people who have mm. a different religion than you, who have a different political party than you, who, who have a different socioeconomic status than you and, and get to know them who are different races than you. And, and when you get to know them and you understand their experiences, you'll have a better understanding of why they believe what they believe. You can have conversations. You'll find that they're not a caricature that they, you know, they, their arguments maybe have more of a steel man for you to argue than a straw man. And that's a good thing. If you're going to have strong opinions, which I think you should, you need to be well informed and being well informed means that you can accurately articulate your opposition's side. Um, and you'll find that you're probably wrong on some things and they'll find they're wrong on some things. And that's really healthy and good for everybody. So I think that's so essential. And, and I try to do that with the media I consume as well. I, I don't watch cable news. I find it insufferable, but um, I do try to follow some left-wing journalists. I love Glenn Greenwald. I think hmm. Michael Tracy is really interesting. Um, those are people that are really not on my side of the aisle. I follow a lot of local journalists who happen to usually be on the left, um, okay. but I get to know a lot of people at the state level. Great reporters, really good uh, you know, people working in the media, trying to do the right thing. Um, I listen to the New York Times podcast, The Daily, every morning, which is more infuriating some days than others, but I do listen to it because I want to know what they're saying. I listen to NPR. Um, so I try to get media outside my bubble and then I have my bubble too, right? Like I, I, the foundation for economic education where I now write was super fundamental for me when I was first, um, figuring out what I believed and why, because they make economics 
entertaining and they make it yeah. accessible. You're not reading white papers. You're reading about why rosé wine became popular all of a sudden. And it's <laughs> relating back to economics and to trade and to policy, but it's interesting. And, and so I think yeah. they do a fantastic job, if I do say so myself, now that I'm over there. But um, <laughs> I read things like that. I, I follow a lot of think tanks. I love to follow think tanks because they've got a lot of cool information. Um, I like the Cato Institute. They have another um, sort of off project called Human Progress that's really fascinating about mm -hmm. um, develops and capitalism around the world. So I like to follow that. Um, I like to follow public interest litigation to see what's happening in the courts. So Institute for Justice is a really cool um, organization that's doing pro bono um, economic, constitutional economic litigation across the country. So they're fascinating. Um, I follow a ton of criminal justice reform type organizations. Um, Radley Balco has been a journalist that I followed and on that beat, who's just absolutely incredible. Um, so I, I have a, a wide berth of people and, and types of um, places I follow for information. And then I have politicians, you know, Justin Amash was a huge um, figure for me. I've learned so much from him over the years. Yeah. Rand Paul has been very influential on me. Um, and, and, and then there's, you know, there's left-wing people I follow too. I, I tend to like Tulsi Gabbard. Okay. I mean, she does <laughs> some crazy stuff sometimes, but as a whole, she's better than others. I think Ro Khanna, who's super anti-war is cool to follow. Like there's, there's just so many interesting people who are doing work. And as you get deeper into this, you know, in my work, when I'm working at state capitals, I'm often working with Democrats. So I'm working with the ACLU and I'm working with Interfaith Alliance um, organizations. So I'm working with people of a lot of different faiths. And what I find is like, we get along so well. We really like each other. They're good people. We have different ideas, but we agree on the problems a lot of the time. And if we sit down and talk, we can come up with solutions that make everybody happy. And that just isn't happening. That's a breakdown in our society. So I think as much as you can bridge those gaps, make those connections, the better off we'll all be. Yeah. No, I think I think you raise you highlight some a very important aspect. Just uh, widening. I have an echo chamber, but at least widen it a little bit. Have one or two <laughs> different voices. And I mean, to to all the viewers and listeners, all of you who have followed our work this year and supported us, we greatly appreciate it. And before you go and like other organizations, make sure you follow us <laughs> and subscribe to our newsletter and that kind of thing. Um, but Hannah, I think you know we'll we'll wrap up there. Any parting thoughts? Anything you want to leave? people with to sort of chew over any bombs you want to drop maybe uh <laughs> talking about the i don't know Hannah cox's political career or something like that <laughs> no bombs but i'd love to connect with people i love south africa my best friend's mother is actually south african mm. um so I, I would love to get to know more people in the country i'm at hannah cox seven on twitter i have my own podcast i've launched based with hannah cox it's on youtube spotify and itunes and facebook so uh, if folks want to connect I'd, I'd love to hear from people and get to know some people overseas maybe have some people to visit if the if the travel ever opens yeah. back up <laughs> Yeah, hopefully the incoming administration will be a bit more pro uh, pro immigration than the the current one. But I guess we'll see how it shakes out. Fingers crossed. Yeah, and Hannah, thank you for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, viewers and listeners, as always, thank you to you. And in, in this very difficult year, your support means more than you could possibly know. Liking the videos, just sharing them on your different social media platforms, it means a great deal to us in the work that we do, fighting for all South Africans' uh, economic freedoms and civil liberties and we'll go away now rest up and get ready to to come and fight again in 2021 and i think uh, on that note we'll end off and for now bye-bye bye thanks chris